Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to the first SANS Blue Team live stream. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about all about OSINT, of course, because we got a great panel today, um, which we're going to discuss the past year in OSINT and the upcoming year and some other things. Um, Micah, can you please introduce yourself? Here? Hey, everybody. Well, you didn't introduce yourself. Uh, well, my name is Nico, Nico Dagens, also known as the Dutch OSINT guy, background in law enforcement and teaching a lot of oats and talking about oats and basically that's all I do. Oats in. <laughs> <laughs> there's teaching oats in, there's talking oats in, there's sleeping oats That's in. what I do. It, yeah, that's what we do. Hey, I'm Michael Hoffman. I am uh, the uh, SEC 47 author for the Sands OSINT class. I also am the president. You didn't talk about the OSINT Curious either, Nico. I'm, I'm, you're the vice president we'll, of OSINT Curious. We'll come to that. We'll come to all okay. those. Well, you know, you got to give them your bona fides. Otherwise, the people are going to just shut off their cameras. They're not going to know who you are. Okay. Well, I basically told them I do OSINT. So if you oh, look okay. me up, everything is OSINT. Yeah, that's right. Fans, <laughs> courses, every, Twitter, OSINT. Yes. Just Google me. Hey, I'm like everybody. I'm web reacher on Twitter. Uh, I'm OSINT Curious. I'm uh, Sans, and uh, I just love uh, doing all the OSINT things. I'm going to toss it over to my bald buddy to the my left. Maybe you're right, David Mashburn. Hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is David Mashburn. Uh, so like Micah, I'm an instructor for the Sans Institute. And uh, I'm an author along with uh, Nico and John on some new and exciting courses on OSINT. Uh, so I do a little bit of different style of work than uh, Nico in that I'm not all OSINT all the time, but I rely heavily on OSINT and the type of work I do in incident response. And so with that, I'm going to toss it over to my buddy just above me, John Turbush. Hi, everyone. John Turbush at the Gumshoe uh, with two O's on Twitter. I also teach uh, for SANS, Micah's OSINT course. Um, my background is as a private investigator, uh, SOC analyst, and currently doing threat intelligence type work. And um, happy to be here today. Obviously, I do a lot of OSINT stuff too, but also not everything I do. So uh, today's all about OSINT though. Right, guys? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, and what a year it has been, or at least last year. Uh, the new year also started pretty... Uh, uh, interesting let's call it that way um so when i look back at 2020 um one thing that osint wise really stood out for me that everybody went from uh working from outside their homes mostly working from inside their homes and that by itself started out pretty interesting because people started sharing information from inside their homes for us to see which led to some interesting stuff any opinions on that well i thought it was just amazing because um normally within uh, the ocean world we're we're always looking at or many of us look at geolocated images we're looking at videos and other things coming from inside people's houses and usually it's somebody with you know their social media account taking selfies or TikToks or whatever but now there was a huge explosion in just normal people uh, video Zoom videos that are live streaming into their homes, and people are not sanitizing the stuff behind them. And so you could see personal effects, you could see pets and kids, all of those wonderful things that um, in the wrong hands can be used against people. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was different. It, it was definitely interesting. And it was also you know those those Zooms were were and other streaming platforms were being recorded and published in various places for the long-term effect. I remember vividly when a Dutch journalist um, entered by guessing the last part of the code, uh, a EU top secret EU defense meeting on Zoom, which mm -hmm. um, was pretty interesting when he joined. And it was hilarious to see, but still, that's the real risk in this COVID times that well, you could be entered by. And the OSIN part of that was that people now had to publish these Zoom links to the chats um, in more public places, right? And it, previously, within organizations, people would email and say, here's the meeting invite for the code, and they keep it off the internet. But now, you know, gyms and, and other places are doing their exercise classes online. They need to share this with anybody that wants to drop in 
And then, you know, the, uh, people were, were misusing Zoom bombing and all of this was going on because that you had these links to all these uh, events that in the past would have been private that now were being posted publicly. Yeah, and over time, I, I, I saw that things changed when uh, COVID started. I saw a huge spike because I started monitoring in, in various tools, RSS feeds and Twitter feeds for those invite URLs from the numerous platforms that provide video conferencing. But over time, it became less. What made me think, were people more aware or did those platforms start filtering out those URLs? Which I, I think it's a combination. Yeah. Probably. People's security sense heightened as they saw other people getting outed and, and things like that that so people then get a little about it and i think the platforms too realized they had a problem and, and did some things yeah just to kind of riff on what john said absolutely I, nick i really do think that a lot of it had to do with that awareness that, hey this is now kind of the way things work and there needed to be more security and if we're going to essentially grab that market share for video there's got to be more security there and it can't just simply be the wild west which is kind of what it was early on because people used it as an adjunct, but it really wasn't a core part of the business the way it has become now. And, uh, you know, in many organizations, you see that this trend of home-based work is is not going to end when the rest of this ends. It's going to continue past that. So that security remains paramount. And just that situational awareness, you know, as Micah mentioned, you know, Micah has his backdrop and John's on a plain white wall. You know, I've taken a slightly different approach because I'm well aware of what's in my background and that's fine. Um, but uh, if I was somewhere else or perhaps someone who wasn't as careful about that, knowing what's in scope there, could certainly give away a great deal of data that may not want to share. David showing off his 3GX certifications over there. Oh, no, I've got way more than three. I, I should show you the uh -huh. email on this side, right? <laughs> oh, right? Right over here is my commendation from the president. You don't you know. need wallpaper, right? Well, but here, here's the cool thing about 2020. It was a dumpster fire in many, many respects. But the cool thing about it is that accessibility to OSINT talks and conferences just yeah. skyrocketed, right? All of those conferences that normally we would have had to travel to, like the OSINT Symposium over in, in Australia, free and and I mean, as long as you got up during those hours of the of the night, you know, you you got great quality content at a huge number of conferences that otherwise we wouldn't be able to attend. And then those talks have pushed away out to um, out to YouTube and other recording platforms. And I mean, it's great because our ability to learn from others is now um, amplified. Mm -hmm. yeah, explosion in, in availability of information on OSINT and a number of other things because, as you said, these conferences uh, that weren't going in person decided to continue virtually and obviously your overhead is much lower than you can let more people in, people don't have to travel to attend. So. Yeah. That was pretty cool, actually. Right, and even the change in format, right? It's chunked up into maybe multiple days. I mean, you saw just yeah. even major conferences like AWS and the others where now it's split across many, many days, which actually gives you more opportunities to engage. If I can't break away and say, hey, I need this whole day to actually go look at this information, I can grab a chunk and say, hey, this talk, I really want to know about this because I've had issues with, uh, you know, well, gee, we've had a lot of issues and just think about things that are relevant in the past couple months where it's, hey, I need all the information I can. Um, hey, what do you know about solar winds, for example? You for know, example. They've taken up a lot of our time. Uh, but I don't wanna jump too far ahead in the year because I know this is kind of a retrospective. No, 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 we're, we're just talking about other but stuff. How do you guys handle those after conference parties? Because my wife didn't accept it at a certain point in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, well, we're celebrating in the yeah. conference again. Yeah. Have another party. So, but <laughs> drinking but alone on camera, does that, is that really drinking alone kind of thing? No. 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 Well, but, but here's the other thing is, is you know, that uh, you brought up a great point there, David, that w previous to 2020, when the world went, went online and, and OSINT was this thing that was, you know, um, in certain areas like social media and all, we have now have this explosion of new data that's being populated. Um, we just saw a whole bunch of 80 terabytes worth of data from, from uh, 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 a breach, let's just put it that way, uh, the re be released to the internet. And it's got metadata, it's got geolocated data, all of that. 
of course, that's 2021. I know we're supposed to do 2020 first, but, but Turbush and I are doing, um, are, are right now working on the OSINT Summit, the Free Sands OSINT event coming up um, in February. And one of the things that we did just earlier this week was to look at the talks and figure out, hey, are, are these slots too long? You know, how is this going to fit with people that are attending the conference internationally instead of just, hey, everybody's going to fly into Virginia. We're all going to be in the same room. So um, I think the, the, the organizers of events are looking at things a little differently with their conferences. No, I mean, we we are. Which is it's good because uh, it is easier to to access these things, but if they're done in, in an old style way and it's and you can't, yeah. you know, talks are really long or whatever, then it makes it harder to even get the data then. Yeah, and how do you keep engaging with your audience, right? Especially in these, because not all platforms will allow you to engage with your audience when they ask questions, for instance. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to, to address that uh, I noticed the huge spike also in how the communities and different communities came together. For instance, for example, um, I'm not part of the CTI League, which is um, uh, an invite-only group where professionals are in that are fighting um, basically everything information-wise, hacking-wise, OSINT-wise that has to do with Corona or COVID. And that's where from all over the world, law enforcement, companies, NGOs help each other to fight um, everything that's bad around Corona. Corona by itself is bad, but all the digital stuff. Yeah. And that's something that I never saw happen on that scale, uh, let's say two years ago or three years ago. Yeah, I definitely think people are are learning how to leverage these tools like Zoom, like collaboration platforms like Discord and Slack and other ones. They're learning to really use them instead of for an optional type of interaction. Um, they're bringing people together internationally to solve crimes, to, to perform OSINT. Um, I mean, these things are are truly um, great event. I mean, they're they're extraordinary events that happened last year, but there is are some good things that have come out of it. Yeah, yeah and this is where the, I think the power of the crowd, because crowdsourcing was always uh, a big thing with you know, mm -hmm. but now with not being able to have feet on the ground, for instance, in a certain area of the world, you can only rely on cameras and social media and all that stuff. So. I found that to be particularly interesting to see how information was still available to me during investigations or just general research, um, or maybe even more during Corona than um, before that time. I mean, I think people have, have more time on their hands now. They're not commuting, they're not doing mm -hmm. events in their towns or whatever, right? So what do you fill yeah. that time with? Uh, and so we are seeing more people contributing to open. Uh, well, I'll also think on, in addition to people having more time, uh, people need a purpose, right? I'm for this, I'm against that. Uh, and when they have those projects and other uh, You glitched, your matrix is messed up. That's over right. there, Better watch out, the agents are closing in right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Run, you know, run, John, run. Everybody, design. Um, but, but I mean, the, the, the challenge is is that um you know people are doing things differently now and and that's both good and bad it's just a matter of of are they protecting it and and that was a neat thing that we saw when all those zoom bombings happened and and, and people there was this huge upswing from the information security the cybersecurity community saying in the privacy community too saying don't do this there's other ways and Zoom, yeah. the, you know, one of the major platforms said, we're going to Im implement a mandatory waiting room. You have to have a passcode doing things to protect the users from themselves. So I think what we saw in one year was a huge evolution in in how people do things, both at a work level, but also as an opportunity to collect level as well. Yeah, but, but with that evolution by itself, I found it also pretty interesting to see how new uh, platforms emerge, which um, made me have to learn again, or at least uh, more, because their platforms popped up. Oh, for instance, the, the Parlay platform, which already has existed, but got a huge spike, which for me, 
was kind of mandatory to do a deep dive and see, hey, what is this platform all about? What can I learn from it? What information can I obtain from it? How do I do it? How how can I scale it? And such and such. And and well, I expect since we will be sitting in our homes for at least a couple more months, or at least in Europe, we just heard that we will be in our homes for a few more months due to COVID. Um, but also with the new change that where social media platforms are shutting down certain groups to um, let them say what they want to say, we also need to water that effect uh, with those groups to keep tabs on them or at least know where they at. Yeah, and, and that's a great, you know, and you can, I'm sure you know from your law enforcement background that sometimes forcing people off a platform is, makes it harder to track them, right? Because you're not sure where they end up going. I, I remember certainly reading stories about you know, people tracking groups, uh, you know, and uh, when people would go expose those groups and get them kicked off a platform, you know, my friends in law enforcement were like, hey, this didn't really help us because now we lost track of that particular set of actors. Um, and so yeah. while, you know, certainly the platforms can choose what they do um, right. by pushing things into a less public forum, you know, off of Twitter into something else, uh, we may actually be a net loser here unless we can continue to track that some way. I yeah, but still, I, I think the vast majority of those, sorry, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, I think these things are disruptive, but now everybody is so inculcated and into sharing things through the internet and online, they will find some other platforms. It's not like, I mean, we're all just so used to having access to all this information online all the time. Yep. Back in the 90s, back in the 80s, if you wanted to get the information that was being shared on Parler, you had to actually run an operation and get access to some person in that group that was human. Nowadays, you can sit there in your pajamas and get this information. Um, and I'm sure that that you know, is going to continue. People will find new platforms and they're just going to move to them. Yeah, but also I think when, when it comes to that shifting and water bedding, people want to have their um, uh, new recruits, if you may say so, or people that are like minded, they want to have them on that new platform. So they will always have to go back to the platforms that the vast majority still use to tell them, hey, we're here now, come come here. So yeah. you will find that. So you really have two things, right, Nico? And, and you've touched on both of them. Uh, one is you have to be aware of where your targets are moving. Mm -hmm. And two, you need to be flexible enough to hop onto a new, potentially new platform that you've never been on and understand how to uh, do the, the things that you need to do to figure out where the data is and how to collect it, right? Because with Parlay, uh, over here in the United States, it's Parler. Um, and with Parler, we, we, we didn't have a huge number of online resources for how to use uh, Dice and Slice, that, that social media platform for OSINT. After people started moving towards it, then you saw a lot more people giving focus and sharing. There might have been a lot of people that had those private processes that they use, but we as OSINT practitioners, um, and I think all of us have said it at, at a certain time, we have to adjust to the platform. When Facebook made those changes and, you know, a couple of years ago, we had to adjust. And, and it's the flexible O-centers that understand the core concepts of how the internet works, how websites work, and, and those foundational concepts that are the ones that can adapt. It's also the, the curious ones. And, and that's something I think we all kind of teach is, is how, do you, how do you just wander into a new platform and, and find stuff um, and do what you need to do? Well, I, I think when you talk about wandering in, I mean, in my personal experience is this. when I see a new platform emerge, I just make an account. I just do that. And I'll just start <laughs> clicking around based upon the knowledge I already have. Almost every social media platform will have a part where a user have, has its own user profile page. And user profile pages normally contain a profile picture, uh, a username, a user handle, maybe a unique URL, maybe uh, a bio description. And if you already have obtained those identifiers from those other platforms because you knew about them, now you will be able to find your target again based upon those identifiers. So I think in essence, people tend to speak about it like it's really hard to move around on a new platform, 
but all those platforms in essence especially the social media ones are the same it's all about a profile that can send information out to other profiles and you can do that so you know that structure well at the heart of it we're still doing those core oats and things right it is it is uh, searching for users, searching for activity, searching for people who are, that were at a certain place or videos to, to confirm or to put somebody in a certain place or or to catch a certain act. We're recording bios. We're, we're, we're doing the same thing as it's just a different platform. And I know that some people don't have the time or the, I'll say, luxury to, to go ahead and, and just explore new platforms or they're not allowed to due to legal ethical or, or work related type of restrictions so that's why it's important for well the, the osin community which is something that we've also seen grow in the last year uh it's important for those places um to uh to well stand and share that data uh, i don't know if you you all noticed this but in 2020 um there are there it seems like more people were going into the the searchlight discord and and the uh, the OSINT um, the Trace Lab OSINT Slack and more people were going in there and sharing data about how or techniques about how to do things. Did did you all find that too, or is that just my observation? No, no, I, I really saw the community grow, and, and especially what I really like is the curiousness and the people who are willing to share their knowledge. That's something I, I really enjoy. And what I also do enjoy, because I am a guy who really likes to talk about operation security within OSINT, is that people are becoming more and more aware yeah. about their operation security, especially in these digital times. Um, so, and so for the people that don't know what operational security is, can you tell them that? And can you explain what it is? No, I won't. No. <laughs> All I, right. Thank you for coming, everybody. <laughs> no, it's um, uh, basically it's uh, denying uh, your adversary valuable information about you, your mission, or your goals, um, and being aware of uh, the information that someone might leverage about you or your client, your goals. And that can be from a hardware perspective, it can be from a software perspective, or it can be by the way you choose your wording uh, online. So, um, yeah, it's all kinds of Right. And, and I mean, just to kind of follow up on that, too, this is not only about, hey, I'm investigating a group. It's also, hey, I'm investigating. You could be doing incident response or forensic work or anything else. And OPSEC is a major part of that because you do not want to tip the adversary to essentially what you know about them. And so that's a major consideration, having really just coming off uh, some of these major supply chain breaches where it had far uh, lasting impact and trying to understand what do we know? What can we share? And by the way, the research is being done. What is it telling the adversary about what they know and then perhaps causing them to change tactics? So uh, that's a kind of, you know, the OSINT application is not just, hey, we're researching a group. It has huge implications in incident response and, and kind of things that is uh, my side of the world here. I love the way that you just put that, David, because because it just made me think it's like, you know, no, normally people will stay on a platform until there's something that tells them that they need to move. Either they've been uh, they know that they've been infiltrated by another group or law enforcement or something um, or the platform itself is dropping them, whatever. Um, but what you just hit on is that as OSINT people and other investigators, whether it's defer or pen test or whatever, as as people are, that are researching other people, if we don't watch our operational security, how we present ourselves on these platforms, the things we say, the, the profiles we create, we could be scaring people away. And when we do that, like we, we just do, scared John away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so essentially, we could be the ones that are pushing people to move to a different platform so that we have to learn that new platform to go and find them out mm -hmm. instead of maybe um, uh, crafting better profiles or learning some better uh, ways of infiltrating organizations for OSINT. Right. And, and I mean, this is actually very topical for me because this is one of the things that Nico and I've been working on for the, the classes you know, thinking about how we automate some of this collection and as people drive to new platforms, that means the work I did here may no longer be valid and I've got to go do some retooling. But I know that no matter what, there's gotta be some help, some automation to do this at scale because I certainly don't wanna do everything out of a browser. 
All right. So you, you broached the topic. We might as well uh, go ahead and throw it out there. So you three have been uh, creating the SEC 530. You have created the SEC 537 class and you're now making, and that's a two day class on open source intelligence. And that's being taught this month, I believe, right? One of you or two of you are teaching. Yeah. And then you're also in the works making a six day class. Now, uh, for those of you that are listening to us, we're not we're not um, trying to promote these classes or anything, but when you research something for a book, for a blog post, for to, to write a tool or to create a class, you learn stuff, you teach yourself stuff. And so some of the, the interesting things that you're pulling and putting into that class or, or the knowledge that you're gaining might be useful. Like Nico, you were saying that um, uh, you were saying to me privately, and I'll just bring it up for the world. Uh, okay. that, that, there we go, OPSEC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no OPSEC when you're talking with Mike on the live stream. Um, that, no, but you were talking about how when the Capitol uh, Hill riots over here in the United States were happening, you had uh, you you look back at that section. Uh, well, I'll let you say. What were you looking back at in your? Is it five thirty seven or five eighty seven club? No, if in five thirty seven, um, we made uh, on day one. We have a part where we talk about uh, how we can investigate sensitive groups, and basically when all that stuff happened around the Capitol Hill, everything we try to teach on day one could be applied on what happened on that day. It's all about identifying the groups, identifying the individuals within the groups, but from both camps, basically. When we have two sides here, we teach you how to find them, what to look for, uh, so, how to do it. So, so when you say you teach them how to find them, what, do you, what are you looking for? Are you looking for tattoos and monikers on clothing, or are you looking for something else? Like, like the hashtags they're using, can you give us an idea of, of how you would look for a group? Yeah, well, well, basically what we try to describe uh, is a technique that I've described in 537 as uh, UILs, Unique Identifying Labels. So we are looking for those, and those can be uh, on you as an individual, tattoos, clothing, or whatever. Those can be things you say, or it can be digital identifiers coming from your computers and devices or metadata or whatever. So. That's how we look at it. And we always look at it from both sides because if you have an attacker group and a victim group, both can be identified. So if you cannot find the attacker group, all you what you can do then is look at the victim group because the victim group will be attacked at a certain moment in time. And the word attack can be interpreted as broad as you want. It can be through propaganda posters, it can be through hashtags, it can be through letters and whatever so that's what we are trying to teach in this class that there are a lot of ways that you can find the information pivot gather the information analyze it and then go back and go deeper yeah and you so, can do that from a security standpoint like you said you can work back from the victim or who you know maybe you were working for a company and you can track back to who those potential attackers might be yeah yeah, you have, for example, I, I have one example in there when I talk about um, uh, uh, child abuse cases where it's often very hard to find the attacker groups because they know how to hide. They are very aware. They're very uh, operation security wise aware. But if we know where their victims are, so presumably, for instance, young children, where they are online, we may be able to find the attackers by looking at the unique identifying characteristics of an attacker within those victim groups. So, okay. yeah. Well, it's an interesting thought process there to that, you know, that there are two, at least two different groups um, that you would be looking at. And if you can't find one, then you look at the other. And we, we talk about that all the time on Ocean Curious and in other places too, that there are a, a lot of different ways to get at the data that you need um, to achieve your OSINT goals on whatever they happen to be. Um, we do have some people that are, so uh, just take a pause real quick. This is our first live stream. And so what we're trying to do is break down the barriers here between the very formal webcast where we just throw information at you and and more of just a discussion. And I think it would be good to recognize that there are people that are chatting with us over here. Uh, 
good friend over Patrick Laverty at Layer 8. Hello, Griffin. What's going on? Um, some other people there. We also have a comment here um, that some people have asked us. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be answering that one. Um, but there are there are a bunch of things that we can uh, we can talk about. So if you want to interact with us, just go ahead into YouTube using your sock puppet account with your increased operational security and send us a message or whatever, and we'll 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 uh, we'll talk about it. We can shift the conversation to things that are interesting to you as well. Yeah, Patrick, do an on Nico. I'm fairly out there by now, so it shouldn't be too hard, right? Yeah. yeah. I, well, I, that, I, so so that, that brings up an interesting point there. Um, so you say that you're out there, but I will guarantee, I will bet, I will bet whatever, I will bet my iPhone right here that you are not a hundred percent out there. Like you have this public persona of things under Dutch Osin guy. But I will almost bet you that there are other things that you hold a more secret and don't share. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, for for instance, my my the code to my banking account. That's something that I try to keep private. No, but that's something that's something that that I make a joke of it. But there are things that are just private, even though that I'm a kind of a public figure within the OSINT realm. I do have things that I like to keep private, and those are not secrets necessarily, but they are private. And I also do choose to keep things private from the case if I run or the consulting job, because I have private clients, for instance, that do not want me to share that I'm working with them. Uh, right. So yeah, uh, I'm very aware of what I put online, but I can never prevent uh, what someone else puts online about me. Or that's, that's probably the hardest part. Go ahead, David. Yeah, and so I was going to say, I mean, that's you, you'll probably find, I think it's probably true for all of us. I know it's I'm very similar to Nico, is that most of my online profile was related to things that I want out there. So related to teaching or things like that or to information security. But in terms of personal information, that is something I do try to lock down. But I'll also say my experience is, is it because of the, some of the volunteer activities I'm involved in, there are certainly plenty of posts about me, not from me, but about me, videos and things that honestly, I wasn't really even aware until someone said, hey, have you ever seen this? I'm like, oh, well, no, I didn't know that was out there. I and so everybody at this point has third that. Party leaks. So no matter how good your OPSEC is, um, there are a lot of factors that are still outside your control. And, um, you know, working in, in, I see this quite a bit, working in incident response is that there are things that get leaked out about companies that you're involved with and you really may not have any control over it because it came from a third party source or it came from some inadvertent source, but not simply your fault, but you still have to deal with the consequences of it. Yeah. Yep. Chair Bush, what were you gonna say? John? I think he froze. He's, uh, he's the black cat walking right he now. Glitched the again. If he can, if there's a woman in a red, red dress that walks across his screen, I'm going to freak. No, no, go ahead, John. Back. I was just saying that, that, you know, pretty much anyone online, they have friends online, other people, or like you said, there's breaches and that information gets out there. You can't control that, but there's still a good bit of information you can control. And I think, you know, certainly myself working in security for a long time and, and many others out there give this more thought than some people do. Um, you know, it, it makes sense to control what you can control. So John, I think you can have to bump up to the AOL premium plan. Yeah, that or maybe a twenty-eight eight <laughs> modem, man. Those fourteen fours don't cut it anymore. Um, are you using the V.90 compression, John? I told you not. Um, I know, I know. You must be at least this old to understand that joke. Um, but uh, but seriously, the 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 interesting thing is that people think about operational security and privacy, which is kind of the opposite of OSINT, right? The more private you are, the less we're going to be able to find about you, hopefully on the internet, the, the less private you are, the more we can find. But it, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not a binary type of switch that you throw and say, okay, I'm off the internet. Even if you are security aware, like I know all of us are, there's stuff like David mentioned that people are posting about us or about our activities online, maybe sharing pictures or videos. Um, and there's people sharing stuff about other parts of our lives. So I think a bit more is like a, a water faucet that you, you try to turn that as much to nothing, as much off as you can. 
there's always going to be drips or there's always going to be some stream coming out that can reveal who you are. Yep. Yeah, and I think there's a great comment here from Patrick that actually kind of follows up on that thought. Yeah. Uh, talking about, you know, how can you can you really help by almost kind of the hiding in plain sight? And I think that there is uh, like I'll tell you from my own experience in doing investigations that sometimes if you have too much inconclusive data, it really makes it very hard for you to make any sense of what's out there. And so this idea that I can have some degree of anonymity by being the same as everything or things that are very difficult to attribute. When we talk about attribution often being challenging in most investigations when you're dealing with things like IPs or other indicators, which are very weak. So it's like, okay, well, hey, this IP came from AWS. Is it bad? Well, I don't know. It could be bad. Yeah. It doesn't mean it was always bad. Uh, it just knows that it's coming from the source. I don't have enough context. And I really think that speaks to that question. But Nico, you were kind of jumping in there as well. So please share your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think it's all about blending in and not standing out. And that's what I also see happening a lot with uh, people starting out in those, that they will uh, tweak their machine, their configuration to be so strict that that makes them stand out mm -hmm. immediately, or at least to me, from a digital per fingerprint perspective, for, for instance. I could literally see from a backend, from a site or a server that I host, that someone with these and these plugins installed has visited my page. And that's a typical fingerprint of someone who is partitioning or at least doing online research. And there's other tells too, Nico, right? Like when you see a social media platform that has a this person does not exist face that has not been tampered, has not been altered in every way, you're like, you're not even trying over there, are you? And yeah. it's cool. I mean, I get it. You know, sometimes the, the research accounts that we create are just smash and grab where I need a profile, grab this information, never going to use that profile again. But come on, yeah. it's easy to spot. Yeah, um, but there's nothing wrong with with at least telling an adversary in some cases hey i'm looking at you be aware that could also be very well be a tactic uh, that you can mm -hmm. about I, I was one thing that i just uh, hear john say a uh, breach data um that's something that i um really have ran into this last year because in my opinion there was more breached out uh, breach data out there than ever when it comes to user credentials. Okay. Uh, but what I started noticing that uh, a lot of major platforms contained also suck puppet accounts of, uh, that I own. So, and that's something that I think that's underestimated. You can run a suck puppet for years and it has a certain digital footprint or it can even have data attached to that account. But now once reached, someone may be able to access uh, that platform mm -hmm. and then extract, for instance, the historic data from that profile. And that by itself could be a huge part of the image. Like part of your operational security should be using distinct emails. Don't have like 20 sock puppets with one email, for example. Yeah. Right. And I will tell you my experience with that. I can't get to too many specifics, but I can tell you that people still regularly mine old breach data I see pe people using things from like the 2012 LinkedIn breach to yep. still use it to access systems. You know, where we had to respond, and it's you know, it's a little challenging at times to realize that these creds become long lived and people use them over and over, and your your adversaries are actively using those. Yeah. And of course, that the flip side though is it does present value to us on the investigative side uh, because it very well may be valid and we can use it to tie those identities back. So. Well, then I find, so, so I find that my time is, is pretty at a, at a premium for what I want to dive into. You know, there's, there's the OSINT curiosity things, there's running businesses, there's making money, there's like hobbies and stuff. And I really have to watch out what I, what I get hooked into um, because diving into breach data mm -hmm. is, is something that is, it can just be this never ending tunnel because it, it, you are seeing that private data. If you're allowed to legally and ethically access it, the, you can't see a lot of stuff, which brings me to the, the parlor uh, app and the, uh, the, the 80 terabytes of breach data. Man, when, when that was released recently on the internet, everybody was like, oh, I want to grab that. I'm still seeing posts in Slacks and Discords and other things of where can I get access to that? The question I'll throw out to you guys is 
when a breach like that comes out, do people need to grab it? What types of people would need to grab uh, data like that? First of all, I think the FBI would need to grab that data. Okay, so law enforcement, gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's, or at least they have the most legitimate reason to grab that data. In okay. this because they want to prosecute someone who- Is there a risk having that data? Uh, I mean, like for you personally or your company? If, if you don't know what's in that, you have to be very cautious when you're collecting breach data because you don't necessarily know what's in there until you've downloaded mm -hmm. and sorted through it. Like in Parler, uh, you know, there might be some very questionable illegal things I think we all agree on. And even just having that data on your computer might be an issue, right? Um, yeah. So you need to tread cautiously uh, with, with downloading that sort of stuff for sure. And I think the other question that it begs a little bit is that if the you know the site does come back online, is it really necessary to have everything there or is there some access that I would have to pull that data and archive it off only for the things that I need? I mean, I think there's an argument to me that's the same approach we take with a lot of other social media is, hey, if I need something from Twitter, I go grab it, I archive it and move on and don't really worry about pulling down the entirety of whatever's been posted. And obviously that's only really viable for something that's really in an infant stage anyway, because once you get up to a certain size, you're not going to, well, unless you're a nation state, you're probably not going to want to pull down, you know, the potentially petabytes of data associated with a, with a site. Well, but you hit the nail on the head when when the the capital um, breach happened over here, or the capital riot, whatever you want to call it, um, happened over here in the United States. One of the things that some places like Bellingcat, like um, IntelX.io, started doing is collecting all the things because the videos and the pictures and the tweets and the the posts that people were sending out from inside of places they shouldn't have been. Um, those things they knew were going to get deleted once people got out and like, oh, okay. So preserving that data in in a reliable format was something that we, we really saw a, an interesting transition for. And archive.org made a, a really nice modification to their plugin, uh, their in-browser plugin, where you could just click on it and say, save this page, save this page, and they'll mm -hmm. take care of everything for the preservation. Um, so preserving the data is, is something that, is uh, is important because data does get deleted. I mean, I mentioned this when I teach. If you have access to that data and it's valuable, take it because you don't know when it's going to disappear. Like we had some warning with Parler, partly whatever, that AWS is going to shut them down. So that created some urgency there. We also had people that maybe delete and remove their own material. Um, but that can happen at any time, really. Um, any sort of platform where the platform or the users that you're tracking decide to remove that data. So yeah, but I, I do want to say, keep in mind that you may be downloading stuff, not only that may be illegal, but also can compromise your machine because I've mm -hmm. had my experience during my LE times when um, the, during the high rise of the Islamic State, they would every now and then bring out that glossy digital magazines, which contained a lot of interesting Trojans. Mm -hmm. With a lot of people just downloaded, clicked everything, thought it was a glossy magazine to read, but it contained a lot of different stuff. And that's something that I think that gets highly underestimated by um, enthusiasts who are trying to help and do OSINT for good or researchers or journalists, but are just not aware enough of the digital risks that come with downloading all the things and hoarding all the things. Yeah, you're absolutely I, I that you know what you're you need well, to know yeah, what you're doing. The, the problem is, is that that some people are very well meaning and and the bar for performing OSINT has really decreased over the last year, right? With with all these CTFs and other challenges and quizzes that are out there, people get excited about doing o open source intelligence. But one of the things that they don't realize is that doing a CTF and open source intelligence is much different from doing an investigation mm -hmm. using OSINT. The speed's different, what you collect is different, how you move and how you prepare your systems, all of those are, are a little bit different. And I think maybe for OSINT Curious, one of the things that we'll do is talk about that, compare and contrast doing like online investigations with doing like a CTF or a quiz time type of event. Mm -hmm. I think mostly with CTS, also you're 
ethics boundaries have been set for you by the person who set that CTF. Yeah. When you do a real investigation or an investigation on your own, you decide, or at least you decide with your team. And that's for me, most of the times, the hardest part. What boundaries are we willing to cross to achieve our goals? Yeah. John, were you going to say something? No, you covered it. Uh, it a CCF is, is the easy button, right? Like you have guide rails and it, it's much safer than doing live investigations. Yeah. I'm I will say though that you know this is kind of where the you know if we're not leveraging the available technologies, you're kind of missing out to some extent because it's so easy these days to spin up an environment. And I'm not talking about virtual machines; that's been around a long time. I'm talking about taking advantage of uh, your essentially infrastructure as a code, right? So I want to put together some things that I can just spin up the script that will start me up an instance in say. Google Cloud or Amazon or Azure that I can use. Oh, and by the way, maybe instead of it being, uh, you know, a, a Linux server, maybe it's now a Mac instance, right? I have lots of options for doing that to kind of maintain that OPSEC. And if you're not kind of looking at this terraforming and other ways to really automate spinning up your OSINT platforms, you're probably missing out and you're missing the opportunity to take advantage of some of the that degree of separation you want to have from your personal identity with your investigative identity. Yeah, so automation, which you already touched upon by spinning up those instances is really interesting. But there is a technical barrier there, right? It, I mean, the the cloud, they saw in the spinning up cloud servers like that using using codes and using other stuff. That that's not something sure. that sure. I mean, granted, it is something that, that's important to know of. It's important. And that's one of the things that I really, really like about OSINT is that knowing of something allows me to then go ahead and research it, determine if it's right for me, my investigations, and then move on. Um, like knowing about breach data. Hey, there was a parlay breach. And that breach data contained X and Y and Z. Okay, now I can decide whether I need to grab that or not or, or whatever is important. But... Let, let's shift the conversation here for a second, if I can. Um, I'm going to ask you all to look into your crystal balls um, or shiny heads, whatever you want to do. Yeah, Nico, just stare into the camera a little bit deeper and look at my head. Um, so so uh, 2021, uh, what are your predictions for OSINT um, as far as social media, as far as applications, tools? Where are people going to be? What are they going to be doing? Or David, I know that you do uh, more OSINT for IPs and domains and cyber threat intelligence and other uh, incident handling stuff. What are your predictions for 2021? So I, I kind of tell you that I think it's an, really an extension of what we saw at the end of 2020, where is we have high impact breaches and the ability to quickly leverage OSINT to get good answers about things is going to be, become paramount because I've got large sets of things to look at. So whether it's, hey, how vulnerable is my uh, set of software that's out there? And by the way, maybe I've got hosts that aren't in the scope of my internal scanning, or I just need to know more about particular pieces of software. So can I quickly query sources to find things out about them? Uh, and of course, any, that's kind of an adjunct to the things that we already do with information on domain registrants and IPs and things like that and leveraging CTI. Uh, but I think it's going to continue to be a, a target rich environment, essentially, where we're really kind of jumping from one thing to the next. You know, there's some chatter right now that we're seeing as a fallout from SolarWinds talking about maybe there's some Cisco source code and some Microsoft source code floating around out there. Now, uncorroborated at this point, we don't know. But uh, that would certainly be very impactful and have a lot of organizations scrambling because uh, it's hard to say you're not exposed to those items. You know, solar winds, maybe you weren't. But Microsoft and Cisco, that might be a little higher hill to climb to say you're not exposed. And so how can I quickly pull information that's not particularly sensitive, just out there, available from the vendor to quickly support my efforts to scope this and figure out what may be going on? All right. Thanks, David. Nico, John? For me, what I'm noticing more and more, I'm, I'm a people OSINT guy by, by nature. I, I, I've done most of my open source intelligence investigations were orientated towards people, which are, from a scale perspective, isn't that much of information. 
when we, when we talk about terabytes of data nowadays being exposed about individuals, but also online digital footprints by individuals becoming larger because, well, let's say 10 years ago, everything was plain text on the internet. Now it's becoming more multimedia. I'm seeing more and more problems within the OSINT realm to look at the information and analyze the information on a scale level. How can I sift through uh, 10,000 pictures quickly and look for that particular picture that I'm interested in? How can I look through moving footage and look for uh, a, a face of someone that I'm interested in? How do I compare it to 10 other faces? That, those are things that I expect to become even bigger alongside with things going more mobile, mobile oriented, which in essence is just harder for a lot of people to grab information from. Okay, so so what I'm hearing is from David, uh, it's about automation and about um, you know breaches. For you, it seems more like it is following the people. It is about looking at data at scale um, in these large breaches to find stuff. John, what about you? What are you looking uh, at in I this agree with that. I mean, we've all known this, right? As the internet has expanded, um, the information you have to sift through through becomes greater and greater. The volumes you have to deal with become greater and greater. This is clearly going to continue. And it becomes a little more complicated when you add in the fact that people are like moving to different platforms. So it's not just all this volume on three platforms. Now I have to look at 20 different platforms and collect all that and maybe normalize it uh, so I can sift through it. So um, totally agree. If I may tag onto that, John, it's not just the movement to different platforms, but it may be the ephemeral nature of the data on that platform right now. Is it if people are moving to chat and say Discord, or is that going to be recorded, right? Is audio only at this point? Uh, just even think about other platforms that you may not traditionally think for OSINT, but like Steam and other places, there's a lot of socialization that goes on these places, and that's a great place to hide, or even you know the PlayStation Network or Xbox Live or all these things. These are all places that have meeting capabilities where people can exchange both audio and video and text. You know, how do we follow in things that may be happening there that are of interest to us that may be happening essentially on semi-public channels? Yeah. yeah. With that being decentralized, me having a law enforcement background, uh, decentralized platforms are for a lot of governments pretty hard to subpoena, for instance. So if you find information from an open source intelligence perspective, you may be able to find it in those, well, harder regions of the internet but still, you won't be able to obtain the real information you're looking for based upon your findings. That's that's something that I foresee bigger problems in the future. Yeah, so the OSINT analysts, whether they're in incident handling, incident response, doing people investigations uh, or whatever, their ability to stay flexible, to migrate to different platforms, adjust to different size and scales of different data, and to work more efficiently and effectively through automation. Sounds like OSINT people got a lot of things to work on this 2021 year. Um, Definitely getting more complicated. I think. It, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And and you know, as you know, in 2020, we, we already talked about how there's so much more data available to us because well, people aren't meeting in person now. They're doing everything digitally, so there's records and stuff. Um, I think it's going to be definitely a challenge. Um, before we kind of wrap this up, I did want to just throw something out. Um, I think that this discussion is is great. I look forward to doing many of these throughout uh, 2021. And I do notice that there's several people that have done some some uh, chatting with us. If you are somebody that wants to kind of continue this conversation in a in a Discord, uh, the Sands Blue Team Discord channel, which uh, has a link in the comments, I I was just posted in the comments of this video, is open to anybody. We talk about Blue Team things, so how to do cyber defense, uh, detect bad things, and there's an OSINT section to that Discord as well. Come over there, join uh, join in the conversation, uh, talk with us about well anything OSINT or Blue Team as well. Um, so yeah, I love to hear people their opinions, especially for how they look at the future, because. Mm -hmm. I, I really um, reserve time to learn every week. I deliberately reserve time to, to try, at least try and stay ahead of everything. But I need people their help pointing me towards, hey, 
uh, are you aware of this new platform? Uh, do you know about this tool? Uh, did you think of this? Because even though I have been doing open source intelligence for decades by now, yes, I'm that old, I still need other people to help. I want to learn. So that's well, you can't know everything, right? No. And, and, and that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a great point, Mike. I mean, I would, I would liken it to the experience you have in any large company, right? You get to a certain size and no one person is going to know everything, but it's about having that network, that community of people who can say, hey, you know what? You want to know about this? I can help you. And that kind of helping of each other with our areas of expertise. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. So um, just a couple minutes left here, left on our, our live stream. I want to give you all an opportunity to, to talk about some of the just what's cool about SEC 537, the OSINT class, then maybe share what's up with 587, the longer class, and then and maybe I'll share a couple of things about 47, um, and then we'll let the good people go. So if now's the time when you're going to you know, drop the stream, thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. We are going to stick around here for just a little bit more and talk about some of our favorite topics, our classes. <laughs> Yeah, so well, I'll kick it up first. Yeah, for 537, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we spend a lot of time talking about operation security, how to um, set your, your browser, how to investigate your browser, and how your traffic flow through your machine to be, become more aware about those things. That's something that I'm really proud of. And mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to teaching other people. And for 587, which will drop later this year, um, I'm pretty proud of the part that we are going to talk thoroughly about this information and fake news and how to detect them. So enough um, from, from my side. It's up to you guys. Um, so I'll jump in here because this is topical as well, is that we mentioned the ever-growing set of data we have to deal with. And in both 537 and 587, we take a look at automation and we look at API usage, and not only that, but how do I take that and make it into a repeatable process? How do I actually scan a large file for things I am interested in? Because sometimes we take those skills for granted and realize that not every analyst really knows how to grab or do these things. Right. You know, they're just trying, used to dealing with data. And so those are some things we're talking about is not only, hey, these are things you should be able to do, but what types of data should you expect to see? How can I parse out things that are meaningful to me in my investigation? Uh, there's a saying we have in forensics is you're trying to get to good answers fast. And I think that really also applies in OSINT as well is how do I get to the things I care about efficiently? Yeah, John? Uh, echo all of that. Um, and also uh, that covers a lot of the ground on 537. We're writing 587, the longer uh, course right now. And that is going to dive deeper into, you know, things like forums and marketplaces and, and dark web stuff and, um, where you can go and collect information that not a lot of people dive into, um, but maybe you should. Um, uh, also, the sensitive groups and things like that. Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground on the course, kind of builds upon the course that, that you built, Micah, uh, and try to take people to the next level. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Taking that's yeah, it's exciting. And uh, Sec 47 is evolving as well. Uh, we've got some some major, major updates to the courseware, including things like um, uh, we are going full on flowchart with processes for everything. Yay, flowcharts. Yeah, students have been asking this for those for about three years now. And finally, we, I got around to, to making a bunch of flowcharts to, to help people out with process. We've got tons of new content. Um, things like image analysis and, and all the other really relevant things to what's going on in the world. Um, those changes are going to be out later on in the spring. And John, you and I are running the OSINT Summit, which is that free conference coming up in February. We've got two days of wonderful content. Uh, John and I just picked, uh, just uh, helped slot the different uh, talks and man, we've got some advanced talks. We've got some intermediate talks, and it is all free. It's yeah, we're gonna have stuff. So please join us. It's free. Um, a lot of, of great speakers and a lot of good information. We're gonna go over. Awesome, awesome. The last time I, I was able to travel last year, it was the last time I was able to travel. Then COVID break. 
So, That's right. so let's make an appointment now. Let's agree on that the next summit we can see each other in the flesh again. Okay, so everybody, the next summit will be at Nico's house in, yeah. uh, in the right. Netherlands. Just show up, 2022, yeah, 2022. Nico's house. Oh, one big party. We <laughs> won't tell you where it is. You have to, that's so right. that's the you have to find it. That's the trick. Yep. Oh, that is so mean. That is so mean. Well, um, <laughs> thank you, Nico, John, and David. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to, to yeah. all the people that have said hi to us in the in the stream chat. We are still trying to adjust to this new format and uh, looking for more ways for you to interact with us in the coming year. So keep your eyes watch, eyes out. I see a whole bunch of people have already joined the Blue Team Discord. Uh, go ahead and navigate down to the channels there for the OSINT and you can continue this conversation. Other than that, Thanks for your time today, everybody. I had a good time, guys. Nice job. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And if you want um, to see John Turbush with a nice shiny head in the next one, just leave us some comments on the right. video that you want him to do it. It'll be like an ice bucket challenge, but for just for John. He told us when he gets uh, 500 mentions on his Twitter account, he will do it. Oh, 500 <laughs> mentions on his Twitter account. <laughs> I did not agree to it. This is where that automation thing comes into play, mm -hmm. right, David? That's right. I got a bot running right now. <laughs> 499. All right, everybody. Take care. Thanks for sharing some time with us. Bye-bye. Thank you.